Hey everybody, I'm Justin. Zach. And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab that. Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're going to finish Romans 12 this evening. And I uh, want to go ahead and let you know too that we are going to be looking at a host of other scriptures as well. I'll call them out as we go. That way we don't spend like the first five minutes calling out scriptures. Um, but all of these scriptures are quoted in the study guide below. So uh, you can follow along. We And the way we're going to talk about them here is the exact order that they're on the study guide too. So if you uh, look at the study guide, you can see what we'll be looking at outside of Romans, and we're going in that exact order too. And we're a little unapologetic uh, about uh, having you look at these other scriptures because this is Bible study after all, so therefore we study the Bible. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to read uh, the, end, the tail end of Romans chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 11 to 21. Then we will pray, then review, uh, bring ourselves back up to speed as to where we are here. And uh, then we will conclude chapter 12. So let's read here. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to, to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray together here. Father God, we come before you and we are so thankful for your love and grace that we do not at all deserve, but you consistently lavish upon us. I pray, Lord, that uh, we uh, open our hearts to receive what you have for us this evening. Pray that you use this time to increase our knowledge of you and increase our faith. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So keep in mind that chapter 12 is basically the big application section. Right? So Paul, keep in mind too, he follows a very specific pattern when he writes. And this is not just in Romans. You can make this case just about any letter that Paul writes. He has a doctrinal section followed by an exhortation for us to live our lives based on the doctrine that he's just said. Right? So he's got the meat and then the application. Right, chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans are, are very meaty, right? It, it's, it's a lot of doctrine, a lot of very heavy stuff. Now, he's asking us to live our lives based on what he has just said, mm -hmm. right? So here in chapter 12, we've talked about being a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. We've talked about spiritual gifts and what that mm -hmm. really means. We've begun a discussion on the marks of a true Christian, and that's exactly where we're picking up now. Okay, so here, in, in especially in, in like verse 11 and 12, Paul is piggybacking off of what he talked about in verses 9 and 10. And I realize that sounds obvious, but you have to keep in mind that these chapter and verse numbers weren't originally there. So him building off of a section is crucial for us to know, right? Mm -hmm. He's not just starting a new section randomly. He's mm -hmm. building off of exactly what he said previously. Mm -hmm. So that means that this section is a continuation of talks of the marks of a true Christian, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I think it's worth Worth noting too, these things right are indeed the marks of a true Christian, mm -hmm. but these things are also developed as you grow in Christ too. Mm -hmm. It's not like you come to Christ and bam, yeah. you are really good at all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, uh, as a pastor, right, uh, I very, very much struggle with these things here, mm -hmm. right. But these elements here are things that are currently being developed. Right? These are things that consistently not only need your attention, but things that the Holy Spirit is helping to grow within your life. So don't freak out as we go through this. Oh my goodness, I'm struggling in that area, so I'm not a true Christian. That's not what he's saying. Right? He's saying, based on what I've talked about in chapters 9, 10, and 11, right? the Spirit's working in your life, and the Spirit's working in your life to develop, right? to develop you into these areas. Because the Holy Spirit does a lot of things, right? We've talked about that. Not least of which is the process of sanctification. Sanctification is, is transformation, right? Mm -hmm. That sounds like a big, scary theological word, right? Mm -hmm. but, but sanctification, we've said, is just one movement with two parts. You're moving away from something and you're moving towards something, right? You're moving away from ways of thinking and living that are no longer acceptable for you. And you're moving towards ways of thinking 
thinking and living that promote intimacy with God. Mm-hmm. Right? And the Spirit's also going to uh, allow certain fruit to be developed in your life too. And you can read Galatians 5 to get the actual fruits of the Spirit. But I think we can classify some of these things as some of that fruit that gets produced as well. So don't freak out, right, if you're still struggling in this area. If, In fact, I'll say if you are struggling in one of these areas, join the club. Mm-hmm. Right? You're probably right on par. That's why this is here. It's here to be challenged because if you're not being challenged, you're not growing. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's one of the things that, that we've really appreciated about doing this Roman series is Romans comes right at you lovingly and challenges your preconceived notions about what it really means to follow Christ. And he's done that in a lot of areas, what it really means to to be saved, where salvation is found, what it really means to have grace lavished upon you and stuff like that. Here, he's now challenging the marks of a true Christian, Mm -hmm. right? Because I think we get uh, a little bit misconstrued when it comes to our understanding of what a Christ follower is really supposed to be about Mm -hmm. and and these elements that are supposed to be in their lives. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take this one step at a time here and uh, we might read one verse or a section of verses but then like I said there's several other scriptures that we're going to be looking at to highlight what uh, Paul is saying here. If you are familiar with like the Sermon on the Mount Mm -hmm. right with Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 arguably the greatest sermon of all time. The language that Paul uses here is very similar to that, right? He's not saying exactly what Jesus said, but if you've ever done a study in the Sermon on the Mount and you notice the way that Jesus is saying things, like the way he verbalizes things, Mm -hmm. Paul is kind of taking that same approach here, Mm -hmm. right? He's not trying to be Jesus, but he's taking a similar teaching approach to what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So let's jump in here. Romans. Chapter 12. I've wanted to do that the whole time. (laughs) Romans chapter 12 here. Let's read verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Right? So again, he's piggybacking off of what he's just said in in verses 9 and 10. And what he's talking about here is once you are a part of the family of God, right? A part of the church. And, And keep in mind too, the church has never been a building. Right? We are in the sanctuary of a church building here, but this is not the church. Mm-hmm. Right? The church has always been people. So what he's talking about here is once you are all once you are a member of the church, capital C mm-hmm. church, right? The body of Christ, right? Then there's a lot of hard work that's involved there. Mm-hmm. Right? He's saying what he's talking about here is once you're a part of the body, there's no time for laziness. The church has mm-hmm. no room for laziness. Mm-hmm. Every single person. Right. Every Christian is called to serve, not only in the kingdom of God, but is called to serve within their respective church body. Now, we know there's an overall church body, right? but you're called to serve within there. Mm-hmm. Right? That's why those spiritual gifts exist, right? which is why I talked about it a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. Everybody's been given, a, everyone who's in Christ has been given a spiritual gift, right? and that gift is not to make you look cool. But it's actually not to draw attention to yourself at all. That gift is to give glory to God and serve within the church. So you notice what he's saying here. Don't be lazy, right, when you, when you are a part of the family of God. No, no. What he says is don't be lazy. Be fervent in the spirit. Now, that can mean a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Right? Being fervent in the spirit almost means overflowing, mm-hmm. right? Be so overflowing with the spirit, right, that you can't sit still, mm-hmm. right? You, you, you can't. Uh, help but go and serve because there's one thing that you'll know about servants you really can't stop them from serving I mean, I'm telling you, uh, here at Highland Christian Church, we're very blessed in many, many areas, not least of which is with incredible servants. And I'm telling you, you ha- you see the same people doing the same things all the time. That's because you couldn't really stop them from doing so, right? I know that uh, of, of certain individuals who we have asked, hey, would you just, you want to take a breather? You, you serve here all the time? And they say, thank you very much for caring about me, but I really love doing this. Mm-hmm. The, the, they're, we've tried to, to give them breathers, right? Mm-hmm. Not so they wouldn't serve, but just so they can get a little bit of a rest, mm-hmm. you know, because they do so much. And yet they continue on, right? Mm-hmm. They're so overflowing with the Spirit, mm-hmm. right, that they absolutely have to be out getting their hands dirty in, in some form or fashion. So what mm-hmm. he's getting at here is when you're in the body of Christ, you need to be active, within the body of Christ. Because if you're not active in the body of Christ, right, you're just leaving the serving to someone mm-hmm. else, A, you're not fulfilling what is required of mm-hmm. you here. B, you're going to cause those other people to burn out. right? Mm-hmm. And C, you end up t- treating the church just like a country club. Mm-hmm. right? I'm here just to get served when you're actually here to serve. Mm-hmm. right? Yeah, um, I really like how Paul it says, says, do not lag in zeal. 
uh, Zeal's overwhelming enthusiasm. I understand this overwhelming enthusiasm because of love. Remember, everything's rooted in love. Everything is about love. I mean, the last time we met, we literally spent our whole time talking about love. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's rooted in love for the Christian. Uh, but to have a zeal, more importantly for God, but also the body, the church, having a, a zeal for uh, God, but since God loves the church, um, you'll have a zeal for the church, the members of the body. I have a zeal for Justin. I have a zeal for anybody who's watching here. Uh, but more importantly, um, especially serving. And so my translation is be uh, ardent in the spirit so that overwhelming or the, like a consuming fire, uh, being on fire um, with the Holy Spirit, but also understanding that the Holy Spirit is the one allowing us to serve. Um, it is growing us uh, every single day in these marks of being a true Christian, what it truly means, but more importantly, um, grasping in that this is uh, an important thing to really learn because um, Zillow is rooted in love. More importantly, Zillow is going to be the drive um, that you can't really stop. You can't really stop loving. You can't really having this overwhelming joy of of serving, of um teaching people the gospel, so. Let's look here, verse 12. <clears throat> Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Paul doesn't say one thing there. He says three mm -hmm. things. Therefore, we need to break three things yeah. down, right? As preachers, we love three points, <laughs> right? So let's break these three things down. First thing he says there, rejoice in hope. Christians have to be filled with hope, mm -hmm. right? Because there is hope. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult when you live in a world where there's so much heartache. Mm -hmm. right? It's very, very easy to look around and even as a Christian assume that, well, this is really all that there is. You might even know it's not, mm -hmm. right? But when you're here and you're seeing only what you can physically see, you can get kind of trapped into this place of, well, this is despair. I have really no hope. Mm -hmm. When Christians are to be incredibly hopeful, you know, uh, the world will tell you that hope is just one of those words that uh, we throw around a lot and it's just meant to give someone a pat on the back or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. right, even Morgan Freeman's character says, hope's a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. And, and that's not to be the case, mm -hmm. right? Christians actually have hope. Well, what's the hope? We got the hope in heaven, mm -hmm. right? And we've got the hope that one day Christ, of course, is going to return. Mm. Right, And that's not just, when we talk about this hope, we're, we have hope that we will eventually get there. We're not hoping that it's real. Mm -hmm. right? We know by faith that it already mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Right? Because the word hope right, is, a, is that confidence in what will happen. Mm -hmm. right? it, it's a beautiful confidence in what will happen. We take hope to mean possibility. Mm -hmm. right? Like we take hope to, how many times have you said, uh, hey, is this going to happen? I hope so. Mm -hmm. And you, what, you, what you mean is, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. So when we said we've got the hope of heaven, we do not mean, well, I hope it's actually real. No, mm -hmm. we, ho we have hope that one day we will leave this place mm -hmm. yeah, and go to a place of perfection. See, what Paul is instructing us to do here is to have our eye on heaven at all times. Right? You have to be incredibly hopeful. Right? Because th there's no real hope that's going to exist here in the fallen world. Mm -hmm. right? You're not going to find hope here. You're going to find things that uh, might distract you here, mm -hmm. but true hope is found in Christ and mm -hmm. in the place that he's gone to prepare for you. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will take you to be with me where mm -hmm. I am. You know, so we've got that hope, right? He wants us to rejoice in hope, not really rejoice in results, mm -hmm. right? You've got to consistently have the hope of heaven. That's what he's getting at here. Mm -hmm. Rejoice in the hope because you know what's coming. Mm -hmm. right? uh, yeah. Hope and anticipation of God's promise. It, it's it's everything. The Christian future um, is everything. I mean, I preached uh, about this in a sermon we went over the in, a, in our Abide series that we did in the 7 a.m. series of Jesus. Um, having hope in that very thing, that we're confident in that very thing of what is to come. Um, and that's the hope we lean to. That's the hope uh, we crawl to. I mean, we even talked about Paul. Uh, Paul said, I will wear a crown of righteousness for this. And when he knows he's going to get his head chopped off. Um, and which we'll get a little bit to that in the patience and suffering. But, and that's the hope we cling on to in that even tagging from the zeal that you have a zeal for that hope. You have a zeal for what God's doing and what he's going to do. So, The second one there, right? Patient in tribulation. Being a Christian does not excuse you from going through life's difficulties. Mm -hmm. right? Not in any form, right? Uh, there was a, there's a great book. 
uh, by Scott Peck called Life is Difficult. He said, if you thought your troubles were over when you became a Christian, your Bible is closed and your head is empty. Mm -hmm. Right? Because what you find here is Christians absolutely go through difficulties. Thing is, difficulties and tribulations and sufferings, whatever word you want to use mm -hmm. for the Christian, they are happening all the time, mm -hmm. and they are absolutely, totally meaningful. Mm -hmm. It's very, very easy to look around and, and assume that the things you go through are meaningless. Mm -hmm. Well, I went through that difficulty, it means nothing. No, they're constantly working, right? Mm -hmm. And he's asking us to be patient during these times. Now, we have to be careful with the word patient, because that makes it sound like Paul just wants us to have this passive putting up with things. Mm -hmm. That's not really what patience means here. Patience is not a passive just putting up with things, mm -hmm. right? Taking your blows, if you will. Mm -hmm. Patience is actually active engagement, right, mm -hmm. in these things. Okay, what's God trying to teach me? How's he mm -hmm. trying to grow me in this moment, mm -hmm. right? You're actively engaged in the tribulations. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're making your life harder. Mm -hmm. It means you're actively seeking to learn and grow through these things mm -hmm. instead of just waiting for them to end. Yeah. Because waiting for things to end, right, you're going to end up go you're going to end up refusing to learn something really important in that moment. Mm -hmm. Right? And you're just going to end up going through something really really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Bible's abundantly clear in several different places about how Christians are to approach sufferings in life. And one of those places is in James chapter 1. So yeah. in your Bible, right near the very end of the New Testament, right? let's check out James chapter 1. When we are finished with Romans, we're going to be walking through the book of James. And if you think Romans gets right up in your face lovingly, oh, just wait. Right? So, James chapter 1, this is written by the half-brother of Jesus. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, says this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, here's the thing. When you go through something difficult, the last thing you want to be is joyous. Yeah. Right? But notice, too, that James doesn't just say, be manic about your tribulation. You know, I'm going through something hard. This is great. You're probably not going to be like that. He's also not saying you can't hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're allowed to feel pain, right? These tribulations are hard, mm -hmm. right? Just because these things are meaningful doesn't mean they don't hurt. Yeah. Doesn't mean they're not difficult. I mean, they're, they're mm -hmm. sufferings for a reason. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice, too, James says, count it all joy when you meet trials for the testing of your faith produces something, mm -hmm. right? It produces steadfastness. Mm -hmm. See, what you're going to learn through as your patient tribulation, as you're actively seeking to learn in these moments, right? What you're going to learn is that you're going to figure out a lot about God, his faithfulness to you, Right, mm -hmm. And you're going to learn a lot about how he grows you through those moments. And mm -hmm. you're going to be made stronger as well. Mm -hmm. Because when you go through times of difficulty, you're able to look back. Looking back is fine every now and then. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do it all the time or you're going to live in the past. And that's mm -hmm. not great either. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, you're going to be able to look over your shoulder and see that you have been made stronger through these difficulties you go through in life. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why he says, be patient tribulation. Everybody wants tribulation to be over quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely everybody. I just want this to be over with. Well, you know what? It will come to an end at some point. Mm -hmm. But don't rush the process. Clearly, you're experiencing something for mm -hmm. some sort of reason right now, mm -hmm. right? And it's teaching you a little bit more about God. It's teaching you a little bit more about the way he grows you. And it's mm -hmm. teaching you, uh, and it's actually allowing you to be stronger in the process. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm reminded... Um, because Paul talks about these all, all the time, but I'm reminded about the apostles in Acts. Um, and if you, they all die horrible deaths. Um, and they're all, they're, they're facing persecution and much persecution. Um, and, and I find it fascinating that they actually never pray for it to stop. Mm -hmm. They never once ask God for it to stop. Um, but when we read scripture, they actually pray for perseverance. They pray for strength to, to endure it. Um, and I think that's the most fascinating thing um, because they understand in that moment is that, hey, this is going to grow my faith. It's going to grow me even closer and closer and closer, but, um, but strengthen me in this time. And if you looked out even up to the point of their death, um, where a lot of people I know would probably be crying and denounce if they said uh i won't kill you if you denounce uh 
denounce Christ. Um, I know a lot of people who would fall to that, but I tell you the apostles didn't do that. They they stayed with Christ to the very end. So, so rejoice in hope, patient in mm -hmm. tribulation or affliction. Mm -hmm. Right. And that final thing there, be constant in prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, prayer is communication with God. Mm -hmm. right? And I got to be honest with you, I think that prayer is one of the most misunderstood things. Mm -hmm. Right? So, every relationship requires solid communication. Every single mm -hmm. one. And the relationship with God is no different. Mm -hmm. Right? He wants to hear from you. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get on God's nerves. Right? You've got to consistently be communicating with him. Right? He wants to hear from you. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica. Here's where we get uh, another example of, of the importance of and the command to pray often. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, says this, very, very similar to Romans chapter 12. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He sees very similar language to what he's just said. There's that rejoicing always, and there's the pray without ceasing. What he means is pray and don't stop praying. Now, that is not... That does not mean you got to be praying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I mean, that's great. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. What he means is be in constant communication with God. And by the way, you have to communicate to him genuinely. There, mm -hmm. I think there's so many times where we think we've got to have everything exactly right, mm -hmm. right? head bowed, eyes closed when mm -hmm. you pray, and you've got to say everything right for God to even listen to you. And that's not a relationship if it, mm -hmm. if it were like that, right? You know, there are, um, there's a lot of times where you might be praying and you don't even think you're making sense, mm -hmm. right? But you get that Holy Spirit, right? That, that's mm -hmm. doing that work of intercession. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's communicating and translating, if you will, exactly mm -hmm. what you mean to God. He knows you because he created you and he wants to hear from you often. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing too is we've made, sometimes we make prayer very, very formal, mm -hmm. right? And that's fine at times. But sometimes formal prayer can take away from the genuine nature of it. It becomes mm -hmm. more about the pomp and circumstance than it does about the actual speaking mm -hmm. to God. Right? That's why you hear people quote the Lord's Prayer directly. Mm -hmm. right? And honestly, the Lord's Prayer, right, which you can find in Sermon on the Mount, like we mentioned earlier, is just a model. Mm -hmm. right? that he, when, that's why when Jesus says, when you pray, you pray like this. He doesn't say pray this verbatim. Mm -hmm. right? The, the attitude he has in that prayer is the exact attitude we should have in our prayer. That doesn't mean you have to say those exact things every time. That's just a model that he's giving. Mm -hmm. Also, we've titled it the Lord's Prayer. It's actually better titled the Disciples' Prayer mm -hmm. because in that, Jesus talks about uh, forgive us our trespasses. Well, mm -hmm. Jesus never sinned. He doesn't yeah. need to pray for forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. So it's a model that we're to pray, yeah. right? So it's more, it's more of a model. It, it's a great example of the kind of prayer that we should have, yeah. right? And in that too, Jesus does say some formal things like when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. What mm -hmm. he means is have no distractions, mm -hmm. right? Don't repeat the same things over and over again, right? Because mm -hmm. that's not communication either. Yeah. If I'm communicating with my wife and I only say the same things over and over and over again, that's boring, and there's no, there's never going to go and be any growth, yeah. right? So being constant in prayer means constant communication with God and constant genuine communication with God. And please be sure you pray in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. That's a command. Yeah. Um, just want to highlight the importance of that God wants a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. um, and since he wants a relationship with you, the, the greatest... <laughs> person ever you could ever think of wants a relationship with you the the god who created everything out of every single mineral every single hair on your head he created everything and he wants a relationship with you and since he wants a relationship with you since communication is a big part of being in a relationship you must be communicating with god you have to be communicating with god this is how we communicate with god um by praying to him um Every single time we get the chance, we're always wanting to pray to him, always wanting to be in communication and also being honest in your prayers too. Um, I mean, you look at the Psalms. I mean, man, some of the Psalms are rough and they're going through it, like tremendously going through it. 
Um, but those are the honest times. I think a lot of times we think um, we can't say things to God. Um, uh, we can't express our feelings because we think um, God can't handle it. No, God, God's a big boy. Mm-hmm. God, God is God. He can He can definitely handle it. Mm. Um, but it, in those times, He wants you to communicate those things. He wants you to talk to Him. So, check out verse thirteen. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This is all about genuinely helping other people, mm-hmm. right? And there's two ways to go about doing that, right? You can uh, have people. Uh, you can go to people that contributing to the needs of the saints. Mm-hmm. Right? You can go to people, mm-hmm. or you can have them come to you. That would be showing hospitality. Mm-hmm. There's a Greek word for hospitality. It's xenia, right? Mm-hmm. So if you've ever heard of xenia, Ohio, it's Greek word for hospitality. <laughs> Literally, xenia doesn't mean hospitality. Literally, xenia means a love for strangers. Mm-hmm. Is what it means. So what this verse is asking us to do is be proactive in showing hospitality to people you don't know. Yeah. Right. Typically, we only show ho- genuine hospitality to people we do know. Mm-hmm. Right. But he's saying, "Yep, you can go to people, or you can have people come to you." But this is an actual love for strangers. Mm-hmm. Right, it, it's you've got to be going to them to show them this absolute kindness. Mm-hmm. Um, so, sincere love extends to the practical steps uh, to those in need. So, if you genuinely love God, if you genuinely love Christ, you will love other people too. Remember, greatest command: love God, love people. It's the golden, golden one. Um, but it, that's that's very important to understand because, I, and Justice says this all the time uh, in regards to like salvation, but. If, how how much do you have to hate somebody not to extend hospitality to them? Mm-hmm. That you would look upon them and say, hey, you, you're not a Christ follower, so I'm not going to extend any hospitality to you. Why do, why do I need to be hospitable to you? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the thing that um, the true mark of a Christian will show that you grow in and grow in every day, that you would look on somebody and like, hey, let me be nice to them. Let me offer them something. Let me help them out. Um, because they are created in the image of God too, just as we are created in the image of God. They are loved just as much as we are loved. So, Check out verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. So as Christians, as we've talked about before, we are absolutely called to love. Jesus is explicitly clear about this. Let's go to John 13 really quickly. John 13, 35. Right, this is uh, the beginning of what we call the farewell discourse. Right, this is in the upper room. And Jesus gives the disciples a new commandment. And it's a simple one, but it's very profound. John thirteen thirty five. Uh, we'll start with 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we take this, we take what Jesus says, and we apply it to what Paul says here. Right? Bless those who persecute you. You are not to have a hateful attitude towards anyone, mm-hmm. even those who are behaving inappropriately towards you. Right? Because, and, and the, the, the reason is very simple. We are known to be the disciples of Jesus mm-hmm. by the way in which we love, not by the way in which we hate. Right? And so... Here, you, you know, we typically do not, especially those who are uh, vicious to us, who are persecuting us, we in no way want to show them love because we feel that they don't deserve, uh-huh. right, the love that we're going to show them because of what they've done to us, what they've done to our family members, or blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Right? The thing is, you as a Christian have been given the most incredible, right, undeserving gift of all time, and that mm-hmm. would be salvation through Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. right? There's nothing we've ever done to deserve it. So if while we were enemies of God, right, he sends his son to die for us, then we absolutely can show love, even though we know we're doing it on a much smaller scale. Mm-hmm. While we were, if, if while we were his enemies, he sent his son to die for us and he loved us unconditionally, then we absolutely can love those who have either wronged us or mildly inconvenienced us. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, yeah, so... When Paul, Paul, so verse 14 is actually going to set up verses 17 through 21. Um, Paul's going to get into this a little bit more. Um, but these are taken right out of the Sermon on the Mount. This is where it is. This is a early Christian instruction um, for the church and for believers. Um, 
the world will say all the time that vengeance is good, that you should hate. Um, and honestly, yeah, I see a lot of times on social media, um, people hating. I see a lot of times it's said it's okay to hate. It's okay to be um, hateful towards other people. It's okay to dislike somebody. That's far from the truth. Mm. You, you, when Paul says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. If you were to bless, so for people to hear, especially the Roman church, when they're reading this out loud, remember the letters read out loud. Um, they, when they would hear, bless those who persecute you, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. end of the world mm -hmm. would have happened for them. In their minds, it's like, this is the end of the world. Literally to bless somebody who's persecuting you, trying to kill you, mm -hmm. who hates you, despise you. But understand, this is, has been an early Christian teaching, an early one from Jesus' direct mouth. Hey, vengeance is not good. Mm -hmm. It's not good to be hateful. Right. It's rooted in love. That's the true mark of the Christian. Bless and do not curse them, but be loving. So he says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. At no point are you ever commanded to curse anything, mm. right? Certainly not people, mm -hmm. you know? And we, we love to, to feel like we've got the power to do that, mm -hmm. right? Like I can't, be, I can't even begin to describe to you how many preachers I've seen get like fire engine red in the face as mm. they scream, rebuke the devil, and that's not even in the Bible. Mm. You know, at, at no point are you ever commanded to curse anyone, right? Mm -hmm. It's an equal attitude of love for all. So let's mm. go to Matthew 5. Mm. Matthew 5, verse 46. Matthew 5, verse 46, it says this. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Listen, we love to love those who love us. We love to call down curses upon or dislike those who don't like us. And that's not all. He says, what, what's the point in loving those who only love you back? Mm -hmm. I mean, what good is that? And it's, first of all, it's very selfish because you approach love with the attitude, I'll love you only if there's something in it for me, mm -hmm. right? But he says, the Pharisees, they only love the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. but the tax collectors, they only love the tax collectors, mm -hmm. right? You are to have an equal amount of love for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Because that's exactly what God has, mm -hmm. right? He's not picking and choosing who he wants to love, how much he's going to love this person over that person. It's not that, Right? He shows equal amounts of love, and that's what's commanded of us, too. You don't send curses down upon anyone, mm -hmm. right? You consistently show love, but you don't love only those who love you. Well, mm -hmm. what good does that do, mm -hmm. right? What you're going to find is that loving those, and you should love those who love you. You should mm -hmm. love all people. Mm -hmm. But only seeking to love those who love you back is a very immature thing to do. Yeah. You know, I've heard people, well, they've not shown me any love, so I'm not going to show them any love. Right? That's the exact same method a nine-year-old uses. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that's not fair, so I'm not doing that. Yeah. You can't control how somebody else behaves. Yeah. You know, you need to be the more mature individual and genuinely show true love, mm -hmm. right? Not loving them to their face and hating them behind their back. Mm -hmm. right? Like we've said before, you can't love somebody in the sanctuary and then hate them in the parking lot. Yeah. That's not genuine, mm -hmm. right? That's absolutely fake. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll use that word. You know, he's asking here to show genuine love, even to the people that are persecuting. Mm -hmm. You know, and to never curse anyone is equal love to all. Mm -hmm. Anything on that? Um, even love to those um, who don't agree with you, too. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, check out verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. This is genuine relationship. He's asking, his, uh, he's asking the, the members of the church, and, and frankly, by extension, all Christians everywhere. He's asking us to be empathetic, mm -hmm. over sympathetic. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things. We love to use them interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. Sympathy is just showing pity, right? Oh, they're upset. That sounds so terrible. I, I would hate to think of what it's like to go through something like that. Empathy is actually seeking to understand and feel how the person feels. You're not literally going to be able to feel how they feel, you know. But sympathy is just a, I feel sorry for them, mm -hmm. right? Empathy is, I hurt because they hurt. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's asking here. Genuine relationships are all about empathy. There's nothing wrong with sympathy, right? Sympathy is just not very deep. 
right? Em empathy is, is far deeper. It's actual relationship. When you know someone a, a, within the body of Christ or not, anybody, when you know that they're hurting, right, there's more love that's shown in being empathetic, mm -hmm. right? So he says, listen, rejoice with those who rejoice. Absolutely. You know, don't try and dump on someone who's having a little bit of success in their life, mm -hmm. you know. But if someone's upset, use that time to be upset with them. It's okay mm -hmm. to hurt alongside each other. Mm -hmm. This is a lesson I've had to learn because when I see someone hurting, I automatically want to try and fix mm -hmm. that the fact that they're hurting, mm -hmm. right? Listen, sometimes you just have to, the, the most loving thing you can do is sit with someone and either hold them while they cry or cry with them or just let them have their, their moment to hurt and hurt alongside them, mm -hmm. you know. Because what you're going to end up figuring out is if you try and fix someone who is hurting, mm -hmm. but you're going to end up realizing there's not much you can do about it, and you might, in some instances, make it worse. Mm -hmm. You know, So rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I, I think that Paul here, who would have had a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, is actually building off of what's said, stated in Ecclesiastes. So mm -hmm. let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes 3. We're going to look at the first eight verses. So Ecclesiastes, we think, is written by Solomon or at least someone who studied under the wisdom of Solomon. And it's all about a search for the meaning of life, right? Uh, Ecclesiastes is really, really interesting because uh, it's stated from the point of view of, of a teacher, right? But the teacher's not the author. The teacher's a character in the book, right? So what you end up finding out is the author, who you don't really hear from until chapter 12 at the mm -hmm. end he's just using this this teacher character right as a as a metaphor right in the beginning of ecclesiastes you've got this teacher who is waxing and waning between what the true meaning of life is he assumes that the true meaning of life is in gaining more wisdom only to realize that that's not the meaning of life at all mm -hmm. that the true meaning of life is to fear god and keep his commandments mm -hmm. but as he's wrestling with this uh, this understanding of what the meaning of life is, he brings this up. Chapter 3, verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, and a time for war and a time for peace. There's a time for everything, right? And what we're talking about is genuinely understanding the appropriate times for things and genuinely being empathetic in all situations. By the way, when it talks about a time to hate there, he's referring to like sinful things. You can hate mm -hmm. sin, but mm -hmm. you can never hate the sinner. Mm -hmm. right, so don't hear us just talk about love for a while a little bit ago, then hear that talking about a time to hate. Yeah, there's a time to hate sin, mm -hmm. never a time to hate sinners. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were getting at. So I think yeah. Paul in this moment is building off of that. He's talking about rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, mm -hmm. seek to be genuinely empathetic in all situations and He's building off of that verse right there. Yeah. Um, so rejoice with those who rejoice. Um, you see, a lot of the times we like to only celebrate wins. We like to only rejoice. We like to only see things that are happy. We understand what Paul is saying. Weep with those who weep. We, we have to come to those uh, in those times of when people are struggling when, man, they have everything. It seems like everything is gone for them. They're bawling their eyes out. We, in that time, must go comfort them. Uh, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And honestly, the problem with a lot of Christians is that they think about themselves a lot. Um, I mean, think about what's going on in the church here at Rome. Uh, the Gentiles aren't talking to Jews, and the Jews aren't talking to the Gentiles. They don't want to connect with each other. The church is actually splitting. Yeah. And so Paul wants them to to celebrate with each other, but more importantly, weep with each other. So, uh, we're there, verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Well, this is really simple, right? It's a call to be humble, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, don't be haughty, right? don't be prideful, right? Associate with the lowly. Very simple here, right? In not being prideful, but associate, seeking to associate with the lowly, mm -hmm. right? 
You're just reflecting Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all you're doing. And being humble and associating with anyone, mm-hmm. right? you're just reflecting Jesus. And then there, when he talks about never be wise in your own sight, even for veteran Christians, you got to know that you still have a long way to go before you actually start living and behaving like Jesus. Mm-hmm. So don't think, well, I've been following Jesus for a while, so I uh, am more like I'm a level up than this person over mm-hmm. here. No, even though you've been following Jesus for a while, you still have a long astronomically long way to go mm-hmm. before you're truly living mm-hmm. right like Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a call for humility, right? Mm-hmm. And reflecting the attitude of Christ. Yeah. Um, so living hard with it, be in peace, not be humble. I'll be honest, mm-hmm. that's what really Paul's getting at. Be, being humble, it's a hard thing to do, um, especially with the church struggling in Rome, but I understand, um, but associate with everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's the pride that sets in uh, in this church, and also it even extends till today. Uh, pride will set in just because um, either this person uh, is more of a Christian or this person is less of a Christian. It's it's all around. Um, but Paul is driving home the fact that to be humble, it, it you should want to associate with your Christian brothers and friends. And I think a lot of the times, a lot of people will measure Christianity how much they. Um, how much they can quote verses, how much um, they serve, how much they do this and this. Yes, all those are are important, uh, but understand, I think a lot of people will look at it and be like, I'm nothing like a Christian like them. Understand, we're, we're being measured to Christ, to Jesus, not each other. Um, now, we do want to imitate each other, imitate in how uh, they follow Christ and what they do, but we don't always want to be comparing ourselves uh, to one another. So, We'll read 17 and 18 together. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Hey, Zach mentioned this a little bit ago, but here's the direct statement. Vengeance is not yours to get. Mm. Right? And the minute you think it is, the minute you are completely distracted from what you need to actually be doing. Right? Vengeance is absolutely not yours. Mm-mm. Right, but Paul's going to say that again here in a little bit later. Vengeance only belongs to God. So, what do you need to do in this moment? Right, you need to leave no path for your own vengeance and a wide path for God's wrath. Mm-hmm. Right, you don't lavish your wrath on anybody. First of all, you really don't have any wrath. Mm-hmm. Right, I remember when I was in elementary school, I, I had a teacher jokingly say, "You will feel my wrath." Mm-hmm. And in the moment, it sounded scary. Now that I read scripture, that's not that scary, (laughs) right? I'm just saying, you have no vengeance or wrath to get. You want to be able to get vengeance because we want someone to pay for what they've done to us or our loved ones Mm -hmm. because we think it feels good. Listen, Mm -hmm. when you seek to get vengeance, you end up making a situation worse and you end up feeling worse about the situation, Mm -hmm. right? So... Uh, it, it, you, what you do is you leave this judgment up to God. Believe me, it will happen. Mm. You'd rather him handle it. It's not your job. So let's go back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, starting in verse 35. <clears throat> Sorry, my pages are still <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. Let me see here. Matthew 5, uh, I say verse 35, let's actually go verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So again, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is building off of things that the Jewish people have said, have heard uh, from their Jewish religious leaders and in the Old Testament. We, this is one of those that could make the series that we're doing on Sunday mornings versus taken out of context. You've heard that it was said eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, that came out of Old Testament law. Mm. It's based on something called the law of the talons, right? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It's an ancient law code system. You've heard it was said that. I'm telling you that's not the way you need to do things, right? You've heard it was said eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I am telling you, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other one also. We misunderstand this verse. Typically what we think that means is turn to them the other one so then they can hit you there too. That's not what he means. What he means is if you get slapped on the right cheek, 
right? Turn away so that you don't seek vengeance on the person. Mm -hmm. Like you turn away, leaving the vengeance and the revenge up to God, mm -hmm. right? If somebody assaults you or wrongs you or whatever that is, right? Turn away, mm -hmm. right? Don't turn towards them seeking to get vengeance. Turn away from them, leaving vengeance up to God. It is not your job, mm -hmm. Right, and the minute, like I said earlier, the minute you think get, getting vengeance is your job, right? Well, then you're completely focused. Right, getting vengeance is not the attitude of a Christian. Getting vengeance is the attitude of a supervillain, and that's not really what you want. Yeah, um, vengeance is not key. Um, you never want to cause vengeance because vengeance will honestly lead to more vengeance, and it leads to more evil, and it leads to more sin. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and what I want to highlight is. Um, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. The Christian integrity in that very thing is when what uh, Jesus is saying, turn the other cheek. Um, don't cause vengeance because there's people watching. Mm -hmm. There's people seeing that. And more importantly, if we guard the church, the church is not a building. If we are the church, people see that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, um, it, and it takes a lot away from the church. I tell you that it will it will make people not want to go to the church because then in their eyes they'll they'll only see hey those are just Christians who cause vengeance and who cause evil mm -hmm. and they don't they don't follow what their own scriptures say mm -hmm. so we're here verse nineteen this is basically what we've talked about here so uh, we'll we'll make a few remarks here but. Uh, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Yeah, you got to leave no path for your wrath to be lavished on anyone and yeah. a very wide path for God's. Yeah. Right? Everyone will stand in judgment. Mm -hmm. Right? This is what we're talking about on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Right? Judge not that you be not judged. Mm -hmm. Right? What he means is you got to be careful with the way that you're judging. Because with the exact measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Everyone gets judged. So God will uh, is the one that seeks this vengeance. He's the one that, that, mm -hmm. that get, brings judgment down upon people. You're in no position to do that. Mm -hmm. No path for your own judgment, only a path mm -hmm. for God's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just to reiterate what Justin said earlier, um, <laughs> we don't have that type of power. Mm -hmm. um, for we are humans. <clears throat> Um, but God runs in a way other level than us. God will provide the judgment. He will, he will do the wrath. Um, and we don't have to do anything about it. But I love what's interesting what we're going to get into um, in verse 20 and what Paul's going to say. Um, to really promote that peace, but more importantly, is the opportunity for them to really question why. Why, why do Christians do this? So, Yeah, he says, don't get vengeance, verse 20, on the contrary. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Yeah, don't seek vengeance. In fact, you should, as he said earlier, love your mm -hmm. enemies. He's building on exactly what Jesus says, mm -hmm. right? B back in Matthew 5, actually. Right? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you, mm -hmm. right? Bless those who curse you. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's what we're seeking to do is what he's talked about here. Live peaceably with all. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, th I always thought this was interesting. In showing love to someone who has harmed you, mm -hmm. you'll heap burning coals on his head. It's metaphor. Mm -hmm. right? We're not asking <laughs> you to dig into a fire and like drop something hot on somebody's head. That's not it. But here's something that's interesting. Is heaping burning coals on your enemy's head good for your enemy or bad for your enemy? Because it sounds like a threat, yeah. right? Heaping burning coals, I honestly think it's a good thing, mm -hmm. right? And it can come from a couple of different directions. Mm -hmm. First of all, heaping burning coals on someone's head, it means like a burning conviction. Mm -hmm. it, you showing love to someone who's been horrible to you will then let that person know that they've been horrible to you. Mm -hmm. Then they get convicted about how they've treated you. You responding to hatred with love and kindness and in helping that individual will realize that they've not been behaving that way towards you. So it, it, it's, it's a burning conviction. But this can also come from an ancient concept. So ancient times, the world's lit by fire. Mm -hmm. You have to have fire in order to cook. You have to have fire in order to survive. Mm -hmm. What if you get your fire started and your neighbor can't? Mm -hmm. What you do is you take some of your burning coals and lend them to someone else mm -hmm. so they can get their fire started. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a loving giving Right, mm -hmm. you are helping someone else to be able to survive. Yeah. So, in heaping burning coals on their head, it's a good thing. They mm -hmm. are getting a burning conviction that mm -hmm. they've not been behaving the way that they need to be. Right, they need to be behaving more 
not necessarily more like you, but in a more loving way, mm -hmm. right? And it comes from a lending of coals to help someone else, mm -hmm. right? So it, it carries with it that same notion. Yeah, um, this is the conviction that Paul is talking about here, um, that when they see, they question why. Why Why are you doing this? Why, why would you extend this type of love for me? And what Justin said, it serves in a two purposeful way. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's the conviction, but more importantly, it's showing them a genuine love that they probably need. Mm -hmm. They need a genuine love to really say, hey, when I look at you, Christ, mm -hmm. that's why. Yep. In other words, you can destroy your enemy by making him your friend. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, I don't mean for that to sound like cliche. That's what we're getting at here, mm -hmm. right? Love is this conquering mm -hmm. aspect, right? That's why that new commandment from Jesus in John 13 is so profound mm -hmm. because it's not just a, I'm going to show love to you. It's love will actually change other people, right? Mm -hmm. It makes these situations different. Look at verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We've pretty much talked about that the entire time, mm -hmm. right? Being overcome with evil is only going to make a situation worse. So mm -hmm. what you do is you look, you approach an evil or a horrible situation mm -hmm. and seek to overcome it with love and goodness. Yeah, and this is Paul's fitting conclusion to, um, to love, to have a sincere love, a genuine love. Remember, everything is love for the Christian, but more importantly, um, when, you're, when evil approaches, when it comes, you, you overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm that good, genuine love, that sincere love, the marks of the Christian that we talked about, these things that we work and strive on every single day that the Holy Spirit is working through us. So. And with that, we conclude chapter 12. Uh, there is a study guide in the description of this video for you that has all of those uh, things that we talked about and the scriptures that we looked at beyond Romans here. Mm -hmm. And it's not, just the past, it's not just the addresses, it's the full scripture spelled out for you there for your records. Uh, if you have any prayer requests or questions, comments, concerns, you can email us. There's the, the emails in the description of the video as well. Bible study will not meet next week because that's getting near the Thanksgiving holiday. My family's Thanksgiving is actually next Wednesday, so we won't be meeting. Uh, Zach will be headed back home to Texas at that point too. So no Bible study at all next week. We'll pick up after the Thanksgiving holiday because so many people will be traveling. But when we pick back up, we'll be beginning chapter 13, having some great discussions there, Lord willing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have prayer requests, make sure that you send that to us too. I'll have Zach pray us out and then we will be dismissed. Don't forget Thanksgiving uh, lunch, dinner? I don't know. Thanksgiving yeah. meal yeah. Uh, after second service this Sunday. So we yeah. have a sign-up sheet. We got a lot of stuff coming. So it's going to be fun. Yep. So again, that's, there's still two services like mm -hmm. normal. Right, but the meal will be after second service. Mm -hmm. Right, church is providing the meat. We're just asking that you bring a side or a dessert. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. Right, just a time to fellowship and eat together. Nothing more, nothing less. Mm -hmm. Just a good time. Mm -hmm. So I'll have Zach pray, and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Yeah. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for this time we get to have. We thank you for being the God that you are. That you're so powerful, so mighty. You're so good. Um, and God, thank you for loving us. And therefore, since you love us, let us love each other. Let us love every single person because you love them enough to send your one and only son, Jesus Christ. And let us understand that in our hearts and our mind with every ounce of our being. Thank you so much for what you do. I pray that um, we open our minds um, to what we actually read today, um, that we truly understand what it means to be a true Christian, what it means to be a follower of you, what it means to show you to the world. So we pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a good week and have a happy Thanksgiving.